It's so good to be with you this morning. We had it. Route 234 from the west side of York is a beautiful drive any time of the year, and it was especially nice today, uh, all the way to Biglerville. And I figured we take a left in Biglerville, and we're here. But uh, um, my wife Betty says she was here before as a child when her family brought her here. Uh, we grew up in uh, the Lancaster Conference Mennonite District in New York Adams County. So there was maybe some interaction between Bethel and some of our churches. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent, but uh, it's it's so good to be with you and to share in worship. Just just a, a little detail that comes to me as I was sitting here about, about a, a call to ministry. I'm part of a congregation who continues, as many churches have done over the years, to call leadership from the church body. And uh, we continue to do that, and it seems to work well for us. Uh, it's a call I probably resisted somewhat uh, in our home Mennonite congregation. It seemed as though the bishop was taking special interest in certain young men, and I thought, well, if I change churches, that'll fix that. But God has a way of coming after us and, uh, and tapping us on the shoulder, so to speak. And I'm so blessed to be a part of his call in my life and to share with you today. Uh, if you would open your Bibles to Philippians uh, and to chapter one, you'll be able to follow along quite well. I, I, I'm i very limited in electronics things. I like to touch the paper and turn the pages. And uh, that's what I hope to do this morning as God uh, leads us along. But for, or if Philippians chapter one, and I plan to read verses one, through six. This is the New King James translation. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Verses 1 through 6. A title sometimes helps me to focus on what I believe I'm to say. And this title was written as a statement that is directed to any listener who would hopefully be giving thought about God in one's life. And I trust that if you're here this morning, you've given thought and you're continuing to give thought to that idea. But sometimes we find people who may be open. Sometimes we find people who are skeptical. Sometimes we find people who've been hurt at church. You'd be surprised how many people I run into that share with me. Maybe there's people still trying to figure it out. But God's word, I trust, would speak to us this morning. I remember, I think my first grade class, the teacher must have thought these kids are already thinking about what they want to do or I'm going to help them along with that line of thought. But we were asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? I remember uncles and aunts and grandparents asking, what, what do you want to be? And if you're older like me, it's no secret. I'm still adjusting. I'm still changing. I'm still learning as it relates to my past career, what I'm doing now, what I'm learning in life. And, and the, uh, I believe it was the Hemp Hill song, he's still working on me is still a part of my personal testimony. But in first grade, the big, the big three answers for the girls, as I recall, would be, I, I want to be a nurse, I want to be a teacher, I want to be a mother and a housewife. And I think the guys were more a professional athlete or what dad does. Uh, mine didn't quite work out, worked out somehow. Uh, maybe yours did. But most of us, I trust, have hopes and dreams, like the young man who on a high school class touring Washington, D.C. after visiting the White House and being asked for his impression, said it was interesting to see what my future home looks like. <laughs> and uh, there's hopes and dreams and there's schemes. And I hope, I trust, God has directed us in our lives or will direct us to do something that will honor him 
and that will help others. And when I look at what my life's work has been, I trust that I can say God has in some way permitted me to provide something that's a blessing to others. And then while I'm working, while you're working to pay the bills and put food on the table and keep a roof over your head, in some way, may we be open with all this that's going on to God using or calling in my life and yours to bring good to others. So the greater question to us then is this, what does God want to do in your life? This has implications not only for today, but for all eternity. And I ask us to consider, is this a work that is in progress in my life and yours? Is this a work that has yet to begin? Is this a work that has started and is seem seemingly stalling out and maybe needs a jump start? And I trust God's word will bring light to such questions that we may raise in our minds and have been raised this morning. So again, in Philippians chapter one, I read verse six again, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I would look at three points in the message this morning. And one is God wants to begin a work in your life. And number two, God wants to do a good work in your life. And then number three, God wants to complete that good work in your life. And as I think of God beginning a work in one's life, I again look to Philippians chapter one, verse one. And the author, Paul, names himself. He describes himself as he begins this letter. He says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. A bond servant gives up his rights or her rights to serve another. And in this case, the one being served is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this is a description that comes from a man who could have attained the highest status in his religious system. He was working on that with all the titles, with all the honors, professor, doctor, teacher, reverend, and go so on. But the answer is today, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ who set the example as a servant. It's a picture of God's amazing grace in the life of the writer of this scripture. He didn't necessarily choose where he is when writing. This is one of the prison epistles, but God through Jesus Christ in his past, reached down to him in a very dramatic way on the Damascus Road. And a great realization struck Paul in that encounter with Jesus and the realization that he was on the wrong road. He was reaching for the stars in his career. He was achieving new heights of success in his profession. He was working to climb higher, but he was going in the wrong direction. And Jesus reached down as he would do to you and as he would do to me. And I ask in that day, how could one be a slave? There's a few ways. You could have, your nation, your town, your village could have been conquered in war and you were sold into slavery. You could have been born of slave parents. You could have owed a debt you could not pay. And the only answer was imprisonment or enslavement. And then when I look at us, when I look at myself and the Bible reminds me that I have sinned, that all have sinned, that the payment, the wages sin pays is death, and that Jesus paid that price on the cross at Calvary. Some things begin to open up to me, because I may want all the good and the great things and the achievements in this life and this world, but without Jesus in my life, I am a servant of sin and a slave to sin. And just as a slave in ancient times, the Bible says, I was born a slave to sin. Theologians call it the origi original sin. And the Bible says, I owed a debt I could not pay. And as a slave, I could not pay it. Never, never, never. 
if I was enslaved for life. But Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross at Calvary. And he's reaching out today. I like the example of the father running to meet the son who's returning after he repents and comes back home. And instead of being punished or being ignored, the father runs to meet him. Perhaps today, Jesus is, is working on one, someone here. And he may be, I say, he's running to meet you and welcome you. Someone who has not experienced the payment of Jesus for his or her debt may say to you, and perhaps has said, you're just exchanging one form of slavery for another. And as a matter of fact, I really enjoy what I'm doing, and I have no desire to change my life. And it's true. Paul, the writer, once was a slave to sin, and he's now a servant of Jesus Christ. But this, my brothers and sisters, is a totally different relationship in Jesus. I'm not free to hate or kill my enemies, but I'm free to love them. If you're married, you're not free to do anything you want regarding your marriage relationship and your vows. You're not free to marry another. You're not free to abandon your home and your family but you're free to serve that one to whom you vowed to love for life. You're free to give. You're free to love that family. He is Lord and master. I'm his servant voluntarily. And I seek to follow him. If today you haven't given your life to him. I like what John chapter one says. Verse 11 says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But verse 12 goes on to say, but to as many as received him, to, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. And there's three actions in that verse 12. Two are mine. One is to believe and then receive. And the miracle occurs when God says, now you become one of my children. So he wants to begin his work in you if it hasn't already started today. Next point I would make is God not only wants to begin a work in your life, he wants to do, and I add the word, good work in your life. And I look to verse six again, being confident. That means I'm not doubting, I'm not questioning of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work, and I stop at that point, in the scripture text, God wants to begin a good work. He wants to do a good work. Think with me. Sometimes when God is doing his good work in my life or in yours, things don't always seem so good. And it seems as though the deeper I want to go in my walk with him and the closer I want to go, there's less tendency, hopefully, towards self-righteousness. But, but there's the realization that, my goodness, I need you more, Lord. I need more. As things are revealed in the light of the Holy Spirit's probing. As Romans 3 says, all of sin. Romans 3 says, there's none righteous. There's none that does good. In fact, the good works, my own righteousness in God's sight, the Bible has some very disgusting descriptions of those works. In fact, the payment, the wages for sin is death. Romans chapter six, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's why Paul can write these words we read in verse two, grace to you, he says, so if I'm troubled and if I'm uncomfortable by his convicting of me of things in my life or my need of a savior, he is by his grace seeking you to do a good work in us right now. Because the Bible says, and I'm so glad that I can say this 
Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. There was a bunch of sin, but there's a lot more grace. That's undeserved favor from God the Father. Grace comes first. You notice in verse 2, and then peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This peace is first promised to men and women at the birth of Jesus. Words of the angels, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And throughout the gospel of John, Jesus speaks of peace to his followers. Peace I leave with you. Aren't we glad we can claim that promise today? He says, let not your heart be troubled. And after the resurrection, he says, peace be with you. I'm not naturally at peace with God. We're either at war passively or actively with God in the flesh, and the struggles there can be generate into struggles with ourselves personally, with one another, with those close to us, within our congregation. During the COVID time, has we have seen as congregations times that we've never seen before. We have lost some people and families. We have gained some. And I get the impression from some as I speak to those who are dissatisfied as we're looking for that place where all is right and there are no issues. But we're not going to find that. We're not going to find that. God calls us to relationships with one another. The peace that he can bring. That perfect peace. And in his gift of salvation, in that ultimate good work in you, your promised forgiveness of sin. Don't become immune to the amazing statements that are made in God's holy word. Forgiveness of sin, justified. The process where I'm made acceptable to a holy God. The basis is the death of Christ on the cross. Placing my faith in him to do all he says he will do. With the assurance of eternal life. In heaven, and as an older generation would say, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. He promises the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In simplest terms, this is accepting Jesus into your heart. In fact, Jesus says in John 14, plural, we will come and dwell and make our home with him, with you, with me, as we open it to him. And I become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And that gives me a purpose to live. It's to glorify my father. It's to build up my Christian brothers and sisters. It's to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a faith that is relational. I emphasize that. It's relational. Look at verses 3, 4, and 5 in Philippians chapter 1. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Do we do that when we think about one another? Verse 4, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. With joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm sure you refer to the Bethel congregation as a church family, as brothers and sisters with one heavenly father. And fellowship means more than, than coffee in the Sunday school class, which is great. I vote for that. But we are brothers. We are sisters. We have a father who loves us. And because he loves us, we are to be like him and love one another. It doesn't matter whether you can trace your heritage to the founders of this congregation. It doesn't matter. Sometimes I'm involved in churches where if you have the right last name, you're really in. And the rest of us, we're there, but we're not sure about you. It's not that way. It doesn't matter if you're related to no one else in the building. It doesn't matter if you're fairly new here this morning. I don't know you. So I can say that, I think. We share a common Father in heaven and a relationship through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
brings unity. Whether I'm young, whether I'm old, whether I'm rich, whether I'm poor, whether I have a high educational status, maybe I'm in high society, maybe I'm low. But the fellowship of the gospel in verse 5 unites all believers, whether I'm worshiping, whether I'm welcoming, whether I'm loving, sharing, serving in this life, in my community, in my congregation. And then I go on to point number three. God wants to complete a good work in your life and in our lives together, I had. God wants not only to do a work in your life, to do a good work in your life, but he will complete that good work in your life. We're at a point in life, Betty and I, where we think it's soon time to clean out the house. We lived in the same place for 45 years, more maybe. Anyway, and the kids have their own places, but guess what? No, mom, you keep it. <laughs> well, we're starting to dig through stuff and we're finding things we never knew we had. We remembered from long ago, some of them were projects that were started with good intentions. Some are going to the trash, some are going to their homes. But it's not so with God. In verse 4, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. God did not start them. God did not start you to drop you later. The great joy and thanksgiving by Paul to God and that he shares with us is his confidence that is certain and sure God will complete the good work he has begun in the lives of his people. Whether it's the church at Philippi, at Bethel, or worldwide, we can claim such a promise. And I emphasize the scriptural fact that I did not begin the good work. I grew up in a place where I had all the advantages as it relates to Christianity, to teachings of morality, of hard work. But it's not by my goodness, it's not by my power, it's not by my hard work. And in fact, in fact Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 relates to us that I was once dead. And why I was dead was because of my trespasses and my sins. And in a spiritual sense, or in a physical sense, if one is dead, you're not unconscious. You're not about to revive yourself. You're dead. You don't respond to any stimulus. But God's stimulus in your spiritual life. He, the Lord God Almighty, began. He, the Lord God Almighty, will not fail you. He, the Lord God Almighty, will bring the good work in your life, in your church, to a completion. And the thought that it is not yet complete indicates that it involves a lifelong, continuing transformation in the lives of believers as we yield our lives and we yield our will to him. One of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 1.18 that says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And I look to the point where I think of that being saved as a process. There's an initial saving experience. There's a lifelong faithfulness of God. And yet I await with hope his promise to final consummation of my salvation when I see him. God is faithful in keeping and continuing his work in his people. He completes his work. Chapter 3 of Philippians, verse 20, says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We hold a dual citizenship. We're citizens of an earthly nation, and we're citizens of a heavenly nation. There's an address in Gettysburg or Biglerville, and also an address in heaven. 
And at the inauguration of Jesus' kingdom, angelic choirs announced peace on earth, goodwill to men. I'm called to a standard I can't meet without his power. I'm called to peace with God. I'm called to peace with others. I'm called to peace with my enemies as Jesus continues his good work. Mano has said words something like this, we're in a battle, but not with conventional weapons. Our weapons are not that which destroys cities, nations, or puts human blood on the level of swine's blood. But our weapons are the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. My feet are called to carry the gospel of peace. As our brother in Sunday school said, may Bethel be a congregation that ignites a worldwide revival. That's our calling. And I pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. I go back to verse six again. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. When I have a hope that's based in God, it's a fact that has yet to occur, but it will occur. And there's a time when God will openly intervene in the affairs of this world, and there will be no doubt about it. Jesus will return. Jesus will call his people. I don't know if you have a cemetery here at Bethel, but the cemetery, if you have one, will never be the same again. We who are alive and remain will be called up to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. My brothers and sisters, he will not leave you unfinished. He will not leave you stranded or abandoned. He will complete his good work. May all praise and glory go to God.